Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, my area of research, which is software-based microarchitectural attacks. And currently, I'm a postdoc at uh, Graz University of Technology in Austria. And you can reach me via Twitter or email or so. Um, but what I'm going to talk about are microarchitectural attacks. And there we have side channel attacks and fault attacks. Side channel attacks, you probably all know side channel attacks from the movies. If you want to crack a safe open, you would use a stethoscope and listen to the clicking noises that uh, exist because the latch at some point snaps in. And then you know that you have to turn the wheel the other direction. So from the clicking noises, which are from which, which are caused by the construction of the lock, um, you figure out um, what the secret combination is. In a modern processor, of course, we don't have clicking noises most of the time. Sometimes we have, but most of the time we don't. But we have other effects that we can similarly observe. And that's, for instance, the um, timing. Here we have a simple case where we access a variable twice. And the first time we access it, it will be not in the cache. So we have a cache miss. And then uh, it will be requested from the DRAM. Then we get a response from the DRAM. And then it's stored in the cache. The next time we access it, it will be a cache hit. So the first case was very slow because it's a DRAM access. And the second case is very fast because it's no DRAM access. So we have some timing difference here. And every time we observe such a timing difference or some behavioral difference, um, then we can exploit that to distinguish uh, what happened here. And we will build our first attack based on that. That's the flush and reload attack. The flush and reload attack, here we assume that we have an attacker process running and a victim process running. And they have some shared memory. For instance, the shared library or the binary of the program is nowadays always shared across processes. And they share some cache line in there. And if it's cached for one of the processes, it's cached for both because of the, the physical indexing of the cache. If the attacker now flushes the data from the cache, that's a simple CPU operation, flush something from the cache, then it's not cached for both of them. And now the attacker can just wait and try to reaccess this cache line and measure how long it takes. And if the victim in the meantime accesses the variable, then it will be loaded into the cache and you will see that the access is fast. So the attacker can then deduce that the victim must have accessed this data. If we look at the exact timings here, we see that in a log, log scale uh, histogram, uh, most of the timings are around 50 cycles if it's a cache hit. It can be slower, of course. We may have noise here. But if it's not cached, then it's never faster than, in this case, 200 cycles. This is really great. Even if I have no clue about statistics, that's easy to implement. Just put a threshold there, done. So that's very easy to reproduce. I will now run a program where I print the number of cache hits on addresses in a shared library, the libg edit in this case. And I press keys in the gedit window while doing that. And you can see the number of cache hits on those addresses here. And after I ran that over a sufficient amount of addresses, I, I see a lot of cache hits there already. Uh, I can just pick one of those addresses with some cache hits. So there apparently was some, some response to my keystroke, probably. And if I now print a message every time I press a keystroke in this editor, I will get a message for every key that I press. And this requires no privileges. This works out of the box on any computer nowadays. And or at least if, if you have a cache, if it's a really small computer without cache, then maybe not. Um, but the operating system or the libraries in your computer, they also do more than just um, accessing some address when you press a key. They might also access different addresses for different keys. And then it gets really creepy because, for instance, here this address, uh, 7C800, is only accessed if you press the key N. And this is a uh, template from the um, GDK library, which is part of the GTK framework. And here you can, you can see that a binary search is performed. So this is the middle of the array. And there's some binary search. And there are those leaf nodes in a binary search. And those are only accessed if it's that specific 
key. This was from 2015. The attack still works. We have not really a clue how to mitigate those attacks in general. Um, so if anyone has an idea, uh, go for it. Um, but it's quite complicated because we want to have this speed up on the one side for that caches bring us. And on the other side, we don't want to have the side effect. And so we run into a conflict here. Those are the basics that we need to understand before we get to Meltdown. And Meltdown, this is also, this also involves a side channel attack, but it is not a side channel attack by itself. Uh, here we attack the out of order execution. And out of order execution, uh, I really like to compare it to cooking. Because when I cook something, uh, I always run into the problem that uh, the last step of the recipe says something like, serve with cooked and peeled potatoes, or serve with steamed rice. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, I didn't read the recipe before, and so I have a problem because the guests are arriving, and I have some latency here. And yeah, now I have to tell the guests, oh, maybe, maybe the the, the f future parents-in-law or something, right? And okay, can you wait one more hour? I forgot the potatoes. <laughs> okay, they will then think, okay, what? What's that stupid guy? Huh. Okay. Um, yes. What we do, of course, is we parallelize the steps that we can parallelize. For instance, put the potatoes on the oven right away when we start cooking, because they probably take the longest. And the processor does the same in this case. So if we look at a simple process, uh, a program here, the processor will parallelize everything uh, that can be parallelized, and it will uh, execute the parts that can only be executed afterwards, after these other computations. Now, if we try to access kernel memory, what would happen? Let's look at this simple case here. Uh, what would happen if I run this? Of course, segmentation fault. OK, that's what I would expect, right? The question now is, um, what happens in out-of-order execution? Are the permission checks done properly there? Well, let's try it. Uh, we will try a very simple example now. And this one works on uh, all modern out-of-order processors, so AMD, Intel, ARM. And this example is very simple. We access a null pointer, which is clearly not allowed, right? It would crash our program. Uh, and then we access some array offset. And if we compile that, probably we, we will get some compiler warning. And also, the static code analyzer is not happy with that code. Um, our code has no effect, right? Or, or here it says dereference of null pointer. Um, yes. But if we run a flush and reload attack, like before in the example before, over the entire array now, we see exactly which offset we accessed. So the code that should never have been executed is actually executed. And the exception is only thrown afterwards. And now we can combine this, because the first access might not be an access to a null pointer, but it might be an access to an actual kernel address, which will still cause a segmentation fault, which we can then catch with an exception handler in user space. But the data here is low, the data from this location is loaded into a register, and then we use it here in this array index, uh, as this array index. Then we check again where, which part of the array is cached. And from that, we know what the secret data was. OK, this is quite bad, because this is really straightforward. You don't even need to. Uh, study computer science to be able to reproduce this. That was also the reason, the reason why everyone was so scared about these bugs. Uh, here's a simple implementation uh, where we um, just go for this address, physical address. We compute the identity address from that and stay on this address as long as it's, an, as it's a null pointer. So it will progress with, uh, while typing the input up here in this password manager. And we can also um, enhance the reflection in her eye. Let's run this through video enhancement. Edgar, can you enhance this? Hang on. Can you enhance the image from here? Can you enhance him right here? Can you enhance it? Can you enhance it? Can we enhance this? Or can you enhance it? Hold on a second, I'll enhance. So you probably know this from the movies. And science fiction is often way ahead of its time, right? And in this case also, if you use the right image format, like FLIF, you will see that the image slowly enhances, right? As we leak more data. So they were just ahead of their time. 
Um, we can also, of course, just dump arbitrary memory. And here, um, so you can see, for instance, the password dolphin18 here, and you can see it here in the memory dump. Uh, there are a lot of hexes here. Uh, this is not hex, of course, um, but the meltdown uh, attack has a bias towards zero because uh, the processors uh, will zero out um, privileged reads after they uh, after they uh, read the data already. Uh, sometimes this race condition, sometimes they don't win this race, but we win this race, then we get the data. Sometimes uh, they win this race, then we will read zero. So we will have a bias towards zero, and we cannot distinguish whether we actually read a zero for real or whether it was just that the attack didn't work. And for this reason, we just printed X's here because um, we, we can't tell whether it was really zero or whether our attack just didn't succeed. But that's basically it for uh, Meltdown. The next attack that I would like to talk about is Spectre. And Spectre is a bit different because in Meltdown, we actually did something which we are not supposed to do. Uh, which we shouldn't be allowed to do. And someone might detect that we are doing something we are not allowed to do. In Spectre, this is different because there everyone does things that they are perfectly allowed to do. You probably know this from, from hiking. When you get to some uh, situation like this, you can go left or right, but you don't remember exactly, right? You maybe don't have GPS right now, and uh, so you have to speculate which way was the right one. So you will go one of the one of the directions, and then after a while, when you have signal again, you can check whether you went the right way. So what do, what do we do here? We mistrain the branch prediction to make the processor believe that it should go one way, although it should go the other way. So the processor will execute code which should not be executed. And this might even be code which would never be possibly executed in our uh, regular uh, control flow graph. Yes, this is the case for indirect calls. There we can call arbitrary virtual uh, addresses. So Spectre, we can say it convinces the program to uh, execute some piece of code. Let's go through some simple examples here. Uh, the first is uh, Spectre variant 1 which is the um, bounce check variant. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bounce check, but this one is easy to understand. But there are tons of different variants um, of, of variant one. And here you can see an index and some uh, memory buffer. And you see that part of the memory buffer is OK to read. This is uh, readable for the user. You have a bounce check here. Small four is OK. And beyond that, you have some secret, maybe a key or something stored in memory. And if you think about memory, uh, basically uh, the, the entire memory in your computer uh, is addressable as an array, right? So you can um, always interpret the entire memory like this. So if you have a bounce check, you can read from their arbitrary locations after the bounce, uh, after the bound. Okay. What we will do now is we pass index zero. And by doing that, the processor will run this code and maybe speculate the wrong way. Okay, But then it will execute the right way and it will uh, lean slightly towards the then branch then for the prediction. And here is some lookup table uh, which we then uh, use for uh, leaking the data. So we need some uh, code fragment in the target process uh, that we use to extract the data. Then. If we process now the next index and the subsequent index two and then three, you see that the prediction leans more and more towards the then branch. And as we get to, a, to an index that is not allowed anymore, the processor will still speculate for the then branch. And then we get our data out there, although we shouldn't. And the same will happen for index five, index six, and so on. And this is quite tricky now because who did anything illegal here, right? Everyone was doing what they are supposed to do. The processor was speculating uh, that it goes this way because all the time it was going this way. So it was doing something very plausible here. There is a similar scenario for um, Spectre Variant 2. I thought about a very simple scenario here and I came up with this. 
um, you have a um, method which uh, implements some, some move operation and it either calls the fly method of the bird object, bird is derived from animal, or it calls the swim method uh, of the fish object, which is also derived from animal. And in one case, we will do some lookup table um, access with, the, with, with some data and some index that we control, and in the other case, we won't. So what we do now is we, again, execute this code, and the processor might speculate the wrong direction first and then execute the right one, and then the processor will update the branch target buffer, and next time it's there, it will speculate for the fly method. That's right, because we still pass a bird here, and when we pass a fish as the object here, it will still speculate this way and do the Look up, although it shouldn't. And we again can leak uh, the data that is referenced here. Okay, yeah, and then of course it executes the other way and uh, trains it the other direction again. So the question is now how do we patch these issues? Um, one thing that we suggested by the end of 2016 um, and then also implemented it in 2000, early 2017. Um, a problem that is not only inherent to um, Meltdown, but also to um, many kernel ASLR breaks based on side channel attacks, is um, that kernel addresses are mapped into user space. So processes have a, sh have a shared address space where the lower half is used for the user space and the upper half is used for the kernel. And this is a problem. So why don't we just take the kernel addresses and remove them if we don't need them? Right? We don't need them while we are running in user space. We don't need to access the kernel. We are not even allowed to do that because there is this user accessible bit. So why do we even have them there? So the user accessible check is apparently not reliable. So we should have some idea what we, what we do um, there to, to mitigate it. Yeah, we will just unmap the kernel and that's probably the solution, right? If the kernel addresses are no longer present, the processor can't tell to which address they would translate. So it can't possibly have a prediction for these addresses. Because the mapping between virtual memory locations and physical memory locations can be arbitrary. So it doesn't make any sense to speculate there. Yes, um, memory which is not mapped cannot be accessed at all, not even in speculative or out-of-order execution. And we named this countermeasure Kaiser, like the Kaiser, uh, or in English, Emperor Penguin, uh, but it also has some, it's some abbreviation for some longer sentence. But it's also, it's, it's a patch for Linux, so you can see the connection there. Uh, and what Kaiser does is basically, um, imagine you have these apps running and they could uh, basically run through this wall, this is the meltdown attack, right? So, or, or melt down the wall and uh, then access arbitrary data of the operating system or arbitrary physical memory. And this includes also physical memory of the other apps. So for instance, the calendar app could look at my private photos or private emails. And I don't like if it does that, so um, I need a countermeasure against that. And that's what Kaiser does. So we can't prevent that any app uses the meltdown effect because it exists in hardware and we, we can't exchange the hardware that easily. So what we do is we just make sure that if a process runs through the wall that nothing is behind it. Problem solved. So the calendar app can still use the, the meltdown attack but there's nothing to steal there, not, no data there to read. So if we are in kernel mode, we will only have the kernel mode mapped and the user space inaccessible. And in user mode, we only have the user space mapped and the kernel space is empty. Of course, that means every time we uh, want to switch between kernel and user, we have to perform context switch and exchange uh, the address space registers. That consumes a lot of time. So uh, yeah, it costs performance, of course. We published Kaiser in July 2017 as a paper. The patch was already online in May 2017 and we first suggested to do this in, in, in a CCS paper in 2016. And 
In the second half of 2017, Intel and others improved this patch uh, because our patch was basically kernel panicking all the time, but you could see the idea from it. Uh, writing a kernel patch for, for Linux, which will actually be upstream, is really, really difficult. Um, it's especially if it's a fundamental redesign of a core part of the operating system, like uh, this patch. So we were actually happy that it at least worked on some machine without crashing within a minute. Um, Microsoft implemented a similar concept in Windows 10. Uh, Mac OS actually had this concept in integrated from the beginning, but only in 32-bit mode. Uh, why? Because in 32-bit mode, you only had these four gigabytes of virtual address space, which is not enough if you have four gigabytes of RAM and want to use it uh, for a single process. So they had then four gigabytes of virtual address space for the user space and another four gigabytes for the kernel. So uh, they did that for other reasons, not for security. And in 64-bit mode, they were like, ah, this costs performance, let's just disable this, we don't need it. And then they, uh, they were in a fortunate situation because they um, they already had some basics implemented for that, and now it's enabled by default. Yeah, all these implementations share the same idea, and of course I'm, I'm uh, very happy that uh, some stupid idea they had uh, made it into every operating system. Um, let's see how long it stays in there. Um, so basically that means Meltdown, yes, that was a huge thing, and we had to, uh, had to resolve that problem quickly, but now that it's resolved, it's not a problem anymore, right? The Spectre, on the other hand, that's a different situation because Spectre does not directly access the kernel. It's not directly some, some implementation bug, as in Meltdown, where I would say it's an implementation bug in hardware, but Spectre is about uh, speculative execution, and this is fundamental for processors to work. Uh, also, out-of-order execution might have, besides Meltdown, other effects that could also be exploitable, but the user space accessible check, um, that's definitely just a bug. In Spectre, we convince other programs to reveal their secret, but the other program can reveal its secrets if it wants to, right? Why would it, why should it be prevented uh, to, to, from revealing its secrets? So it's much harder to fix. Kaiser won't help any, anything here. Um, and there's an ongoing effort to patch this via microcode updates and compiler extensions. I won't go into details here um, because um, that would consume too much time now. And I want to talk about something different now, some other microarchitectural attack. Because those attacks were about uh, reading data that you're not supposed to read, right? But what about writing data that we're not supposed to be able to write to. Uh, yes, and that brings us to Rowhammer. Also a very interesting effect here, uh, and this is a, um, an effect that exists in DRAM modules. And if you look at a modern computer, you probably have something like two modules, and uh, they will then uh, run as separate channels, and they can uh, run in parallel, so you can do accesses to, the, to those two channels in parallel. And you will have multiple sides probably on the, DR, uh, on the DRAM module, and we call them ranks. And if you look at one chip in closer detail, you will see that um, a chip is comprised of several banks, typically something like eight or 16 banks. And each bank has a large number of rows, something like 32,000, 64,000, something like that. These rows are the actual capacitors that store each single bit. And when we want to access one row, if we want to read data from this row, then actually the, date, the, the um, charge from this capacitor is measured. So we measure the, the uh, voltage uh, there. So we have some sense amplifier down there that measures the voltage and stores the, the result, a one or a zero, in this row buffer, which is probably some SRAM or something uh, some just some register. Um, so there we uh, can store the data so that it can be sent to the memory bus. The Rohammer effect is not um, that new. So the DRAM manufacturers knew about it since uh, at least the mid mid 90s. And 
we have two things that we need to consider here. First, the cells leak just by themselves because they are uh, capacitors, they leak over time. So you need to refresh them so that you still have the charge, enough charge in there. And refreshing just means reading them into the row buffer and uh, writing them back into the actual, con uh, into the actual capacitors. There is a maximum interval between refreshes to guarantee data integrity and the uh, vendors have to comply with that. So the module has to uh, work reliably when they go for the maximum interval, the, when, the, when the memory controller does that. And then the effect that is called row hammer is that cells leak faster upon proximate accesses. And this is dangerous because if that happens, then we could influence from memory access patterns what happens when this, um, or when this um, error occurs. So we would just activate one row, we would activate another row, and the first one again, and the second one again, and after we do this something like uh, 500,000 times, we will see bit flips in the middle row. And this is quite bad because this middle row, this might be something like a 512 kilobyte region. Probably we didn't even have access to this 512 kilobyte region. It might be some kernel memory that we corrupt there. Until recently, there were two different hammering techniques. The first one accesses something like eight addresses. And these addresses are randomly selected, but we try to, um, so what we try to do is here um, that at least two of them go into the same bank. A second technique, so the first technique we call this single-sided hammering. The second technique hammers exactly two rows, which are uh, surrounding one row that we uh, then call the victim row. But we again choose those two rows, we choose uh, the, them, them randomly, uh, but they should be neighboring the same row. And we propose the third method, um, which is called um, single location or one location hammering. And uh, there we only hammer one row next to a victim row. So we will look at those techniques now in detail. We hammer different locations here in single-sided hammering, and we expect bit flips directly next to one of them. In double-sided hammering, uh, we hammer two locations and expect the bit flips between uh, the two rows or directly next to one of them. And in one location hammering, that works because modern multi-core computers actually close the row as soon as possible. So we can just activate it by re-accessing it all the time. And yeah, then we have bit flips directly next to this row. Are these random bit flips? Yeah, they are random if you don't understand what the reason is why they occur, right? Uh, at first, they are random. They are at random offsets, but they are reproducible. If you would hammer the same locations again, you would see the same bit flip pattern. And uh, because this is highly reproducible, this is very easy, um, a very easy tool for um, exploits. For instance, you could place some data structure, maybe a kernel data structure, um, at some arbitrary memory location. You could spray uh, kernel data structures like page tables over the entire memory. You can scan the entire memory for good bit flips. And then if you do then the spraying, right, in step three, spray the page tables over the entire memory and trigger the bit flip again, then you have the bit flip in exactly the right location where you want it to be because you scanned for good bit flips in the second step. So you can basically decide where in the memory to set a bit to one. And this is very powerful because you, that's memory that you don't have access to usually. It could be a supervisor bit or it could be uh, some address mapping um, physical memory. What if we cannot target kernel pages? Because there were countermeasures proposed. Um, there were a lot of countermeasures. Most of them assumed that you have to do uh, double-sided hammering or single-sided hammering. So you have to access multiple locations in the same bank. We showed that this is not the case. Um, and other countermeasures proposed, uh, well, let's just keep the kernel pages far, fr far away from the user pages and then we're safe because it has to be in proximity, right? But we can also just target applications running as root and we can, as an unprivileged user, start applications running as root. For instance, sudo. Sudo runs as root and everyone can, anyone can, can run sudo. 
And in sudo, you will probably have a password check and the password check will probably use some instruction like jump equal. And if you flip a bit in jump equal, then you get a different opcode out of that. Most of them are not useful for us, but some of them are. Especially this one is nice. And every, every wrong password is now a correct password. And the correct password doesn't work anymore. But uh, very unfortunate. <laughs> Um, so the question is, what do we learn from it? First of all, we have ignored microarchitectural attacks for many, many years. Uh, the first uh, such attacks were proposed in 1996, Approx uh, approximately the same time uh, the hardware uh, that uh, was the first hardware that was susceptible to Spectre and Meltdown was created. So if we would have already back then thought, uh, okay, these attacks are really significant and we should be very careful to not introduce more of uh, those side channels, then we might have been in a much different situation today. But back then, uh, the attacks were uh, published in the cryptographic community because the crypto community was most uh, concerned about uh, side channel text back then. And well, what the, what the crypto community back then decided was um, software should be fixed, right? If, if you have a crypto algorithm and it's not even protected against side channels, I mean, that should be standard for a crypto algorithm. And probably that's true. Probably we should expect from a crypto algorithm that it that the implementation is secure against side channels. But at the same time, we should all also keep in mind that these attacks might also be applied to something other than crypto, where it's not so easy to uh, find a defense. We have seen in 2013 and then in 2016 again, attacks on ASLR or kernel ASLR. And uh, there also, when we reported this to different vendors, we got the response, yeah, ASLR is broken anyway. What do you want to achieve with your attack? You're attacking something that is already broken, uh, completely useless. Okay, well, uh, if, so back then we proposed that they uh, implement Kaiser as a response to the prefetch side channel attack. If they would have done that, they would have been safe from Meltdown, but no one could have known, right? Uh, we, we, at least we didn't know. Um, so. We had one attack that we presented that was also uh, very funny. Uh, so SGX says uh, side channels are out of scope, right? They are not part of the threat model, uh, but you have you see uh, Bitcoin wallets implemented in SGX, and in those implementations, we checked some of those, and some use uh, insecure crypto algorithms, so algorithms that are susceptible to side channel attacks. If one can steal money from you then it shouldn't be outside of scope, right? Um, so if, if one can steal money, then, then you should consider it. It doesn't work like that. But this was the response that we got, not part of the threat model. The attacker is not allowed to use a side channel. Um, row hammer attacks, uh, interesting response there, uh, because uh, the prevalence studies uh, on row hammer say that 60 to 80% of the modules are affected. And what we got as a response was, was, yeah, this only affects cheap substandard modules and also ECC memory is safe. And okay, if 60 to 80% is cheap substandard, then probably we should all invest more money into uh, DRAM modules, right? Um, I don't know also where the other um, non-substandard modules go. Um, okay, so what we learn is we, we, for years, we solely optimized for performance. And that was a reasonable choice, probably, because we needed the performance in computing. But at some point, you also might want to have security. Also, when you read uh, the manuals, after you found a side channel, you realize that everything was documented. For instance, in case of the prefetch side channel attack, um, it says, um, Prefetching um, inaccessible addresses may have non-deterministic uh, latencies. I would really be surprised if Intel has something truly non-deterministic in their processors, because that's really difficult to build. Uh, so probably it's just non-deterministic as a, as a word for, we don't want to explain how it comes to this timing. Um, also for speculative execution, they have a sentence in there saying speculative execution may load things into the cache and leave, uh, leave them in the cache there. 
everything was documented, but back then we didn't read it in this way. And also probably Intel didn't read it in this way. Uh, only now we understand the implications. And maybe we are now at a turning point, a turning point that the car industry, the motor, motor uh, vehicle industry had in the 60s when they figured, okay, it's great to go 200 miles per hour with a car, but it's also great if you, if you have a crash with something like 30 miles per hour to not die. Uh, so maybe we should have seat belts and not fly through the windscreen. Uh, and then more seat belts. So in the beginning, we only had them for the, for the front row, right? And so the, the children on the back row, they were still allowed to fly. But uh, then it, it took many years until they realized that it might be a good idea to also have them on the back seat. And actually, people were really uh, opposed to that. They didn't want to have seat belts. They said like, okay, why, why would, what, would you want to restrict my freedom to... And airbags, nowadays we have airbags on the outside of cars and it's great. So we have a lot of innovation in cars uh, going uh, for uh, safety. And it's about the, the situation of having an accident. Most of the time we, we just hope that we don't have an accident, right? So we pay a lot of money for a situation that we hope does not occur. And probably we should have the same in the computer industry. We should probably invest a lot of money for situations that we hope just do not occur, just to be safe uh, in those situations. So probably something like Meltdown Inspector is a unique chance to rethink process or de design, uh, but that, that will be complicated because uh, out of order execution and speculative execution is deeply buried in modern processors. And the other chance is maybe to grow up like other fields define what we need in security and invest a lot of uh, time and money and effort into security mechanisms where the car industry or the construction industry have safety mechanisms. And also, uh, how, did we, how did something like, like, like Meltdown or Spectre go unnoticed for 20 years? That's also quite uh, impressive, right? Maybe we invested too much time into mitigating known problems and too little time into identifying unknown problems. So probably we should also invest a lot more time into investigating what other uh, attacks there are, what other attacks are possible. And with that, I would like to close and I'm open for uh, questions. I completely agree. Uh, so it's uh, not a problem of SGX here, um, but the problem is um, rather a very practical one, a real-world problem, uh, because when you look at real-world um, at, 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 uh, industry products that use SGX or Trust Zone, they make assumptions about uh, what security properties SGX or Trust Zone provide. So you will see things like T-table AES implementations in Trust Zone, and TrustZone doesn't do anything against uh, cache attacks, right? It doesn't even claim that. Uh, so, sim same for, for SGX. But but then it's still important that researchers make very clear point that it's not protecting against that, not even making the attacks harder, but that is just doing nothing against uh, these side channel attacks. Because many, still many, many uh, um, companies uh, assume that um, SGX at least makes it harder to run these attacks. So we have maybe one last question. Mm -hmm. So we, we now have uh, Spectre variant 1 and 2. Are we done here or should we also expect 3, 4 and 100? 
um, I hope not 100, but um, <laughs> we might reach two digits. <laughs> so we're talking about a new class of the DEX. Yeah, yeah. So um, generally, there are way more things in processors where speculation happens than just branch prediction and another form of branch prediction, right? There are even more variants of branch prediction that I didn't, didn't mention, uh, but also there, there's a lot more speculation going on in, in modern processors, and those will all be spectre variants over time. So on that frame, 